In this session, we're going to talk about participatory cultures. We're going to find out what they are in a digital context. We'll analyze their common characteristics. We'll explore some examples and we'll evaluate their contribution to digital media and culture. Then in our groups, we'll apply what we've learned to help us design some participatory cultures of our own. Professor Henry Jenkins is probably the most influential scholar of participatory cultures. I'll refer to his work in this video and I'll post some links to it on Aula, as well as other resources you'll find interesting. So without further ado, let's lift the lid on participatory cultures. Participation means being actively involved, taking part in something. And a culture is the collected ideas, behaviours and activities of a group of people. So a participatory culture is one where people with interests and aims in common come together and form bonds through group activities. OK, what are the hallmarks of a participatory culture? Typically, one will be easy to join and easy to get involved with. Supportive, especially when creating and sharing content. And friendly, in that experienced members will help and mentor and advise newcomers. Also, all of the members will believe that their contributions matter. They'll feel a social connection with each other, even if they're thousands of miles apart. And they'll care what other members think about their contributions. Also, and to my mind, this is the main differentiator, there's no quid pro quo, which means the group asks for nothing in return. Basically, it's all free. For example, I learnt how to make the motion graphics for this video from Photo Joseph. I think it's fair to say that for anybody doing YouTube videos, we would all create creator with 53,000 followers on YouTube. I subscribe to his channel and I've chosen to contribute to his Patreon account. But that's voluntary. Joe doesn't charge me or any of his community of followers. And if someone gets stuck or has a question, we can ask the community for help. And more likely than not, one of us will have the answer. In comparison, the admittedly excellent FCPX editing course I attended at the YouTube space in London cost £200 plus travelling expenses. A dozen of us spent eight hours in a lab learning from an expert. At the end of the day, I left with my notes, some tip sheets and a handful of LinkedIn connections. Have you had a similar experience? What are you into? Harry Potter? The supernatural? Science fiction? Game of Thrones? If you are, there's a fandom for you. A fandom is an example of not only a participatory culture, but also a subculture, which is defined as a cultural group within a larger culture, often having beliefs or interests that are at variance with those of that larger culture. The prevailing view is that modern fandom developed in the 1960s around the TV sci-fi series Star Trek. Now, at that time, fans generally spread their creations through fanzines or conventions. Fanzine is a portmanteau word combining fan and magazine. Fanzines like Science Fiction Review were written by their readership, then printed and posted to fans on a mailing list. They were amateur productions, meaning their creators weren't paid. The content often looked professional, though. There was fantastic artwork and stories expanding on popular TV shows and themes. The internet took fanzines and fandom to the next level. You no longer needed to print multiple copies, write envelopes or buy lots of postage stamps. Publishing online allowed existing fanzines to reach a wider global audience. In addition, all kinds of new audience subcultures sprang up. All you needed was a website and later social media and mobile. An iPod. <laughs> a phone. Sent fandom and fanzines stratospheric.
the brony fandom clearly illustrates this kind of media subculture. Attracting fans of the TV series My Little Pony all over the world. To be precise, the cartoon series was a spin-off of a range of toys first sold by Hasbro in the 1980s. The name Brony, it's another portmanteau word, a combination of bro, short for brother, and pony. The extent to which the fandom influenced the production of a My Little Pony movie in 2019 is moot. However, the decision to axe the TV series showed just how passionate bronies were, and still are, about their participatory culture. Who doesn't love dressing up? Go to a Star Wars convention and you'll see fans dressed as their favourite characters. In cosplay, hey, another portmanteau word combining costume and play, fans act out scenes from movies or scripts they've written themselves. This takes place in real time and real space. But I wonder sometimes, to what extent does the Star Wars franchise owe its various sequels, prequels and spin-offs like The Mandalorian to stories first written and published on fan sites? Were they the inspiration? I wonder. Imagine we're going to start a vlog about makeup and beauty. We can produce, present and publish our content on social media. With the clever use of metadata, among other things, we'll gather a following on YouTube, Instagram and Twitter where we'll interact with our followers to make them feel part of it. We are attracting people, pulling them in, listening to them, giving them a platform and a voice. And if they want to give us a couple of dollars for the experience, well, hey, that's great. Furthermore, a participatory culture is one in which private individuals aren't just consumers, they're also contributors and producers, or to use yet another portmanteau word, prosumers. Contrast this with the conventional 20th century linear media model, where a broadcaster would commission a TV show about makeup and beauty. They would audition for a presenter, a celebrity probably, who would be the face of the series. Six episodes would be filmed, say, edited and then transmitted, and that would be more or less that. They'd made a product and delivered it to their target audience. Oh, and based on the popularity of the show, the TV company would make money. They might even commission a second series. Some scholars like Henry Jenkins expected participatory culture to turn the world of conventional media on its head. To an extent it did, but in recent years corporate culture has regrouped, and some of the formerly subversive subcultural players have morphed into what I'm going to call the new mainstream. Take Netflix. What started as two guys running an online DVD rental service blossomed into one of the world's biggest broadcasters. Why? Well, their success was made possible by unmetered broadband internet access. And, crucial this, the fact that Reed Hastings and Mark Randolph saw it all coming. How powerful is Netflix? In April 2020, Forbes reported they were worth 194 billion US dollars. How does that affect the creative community? Well, Netflix recently took out an indefinite lease on the whole of Shepperton Studios, a creative space of 145,000 square meters. If you want to make a movie near London, you've got to negotiate with Netflix. And there are new players in the field. The largest publisher of video in the world is Facebook. And don't forget, Facebook bought Instagram like Google bought YouTube. In economic terms, this is called horizontal integration. The acquisition by one business of another, often a competitor, at the same level of the supply chain. But hey, aren't participatory cultures about subverting the pillars of capitalism that prevent creative people from expressing themselves freely? Well, yes they are. But money talks. The beneficent democracy of the early days of the World Wide Web was, I guess like the American West, ripe for expansion. And now who dominates it? Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft and Apple. 
In 2005, half of American teens had produced and shared online content. Inevitably, participation will have increased over the last 15 years. But now the process of participating is dominated by the owners of the platforms who make the process of sharing so easy. Who owns the copyright of your photos? You or Mark Zuckerberg? Let's look at participatory cultures from a marketing standpoint. Sales departments soon realised that if a product gathered an online following of loyal fans, it gained a commercial advantage. Witness how Apple leverages its cult status, using its fans to generate speculation and enthusiasm ahead of a product launch. At the product development stage, photos of prototypes that are miraculously leaked to various industry insiders turn legions of fans into a global focus group. Set your bots to crawl the message boards. Use AI and machine learning to pass the data. It's how Apple, Sony, General Motors, Coca-Cola, all of them conduct the kind of qualitative research that was impossible just a couple of years ago. It's starting to feel as if participatory cultures, which were all about subversion, have themselves been subverted. Is that what's happening? Is subversion the new mainstream? Is disruption the new convention? If so, is it necessarily a bad thing? Where is it all going? And what does it mean for digital creatives like us? Music